So thank you everyone for joining today's webinar. Bonjour tout le monde et bienvenue. Before we begin, we will be providing instructions on how to activate the simultaneous interpretation to allow attendees to switch your audio feed right away. These instructions will be in French first, so please stand by. <clears throat> Bien que plusieurs d'entre vous avez sans doute déjà participé à des réunions Zoom, elles n'incluaient peut-être pas l'option d'interprétation simultanée. Pour faire passer le canal audio du français à l'anglais et inversement, amenez votre curseur de souris n'importe où sur la fenêtre de Zoom et une barre d'outils apparaîtra au bas de l'écran. L'un des outils ressemble à un globe terrestre et s'intitule « Interprétation ». En cliquant sur cette icône, vous pouvez passer d'une langue à l'autre grâce aux interprètes qui travaillent en coulisses. Malheureusement, nous ne pouvons pas afficher les diapositives simultanément en anglais et en français. Par contre, vous trouverez un lien aux diapositives en français dans la fenêtre « Discussion » ou pour ceux qui utilisent la plateforme « Chat » la plateforme, pardon, Zoom en anglais, euh, la fonction s'intitule Chat. En copiant et collant ce lien dans votre navigateur Internet, vous pourrez ouvrir les diapositives en français et suivre pendant la présentation. Although many of you have probably had Zoom meetings before, they may have not included simultaneous interpretation. To switch the audio feed between English and French, move your mouse anywhere over the Zoom screen and a toolbar will appear at the bottom. Click the interpretation icon, the one that looks like a globe, and switch between English and French, thanks to our simultaneous interpreters who are busy at work. I will now pass uh, the microphone to Linda McDonald. Oh. Go ahead, Linda. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Linda McDonald, and I'll be your host for this afternoon's live webinar with Helen Knowlton Strategies Vice President and Group Lead on Public Affairs in Ottawa, John Delacourt. I'm joining you today from east of Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, which is Robinson Huron Treaty Territory. The land from which I'm joining you is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg people specifically the Garden River and Batchewana First Nations, as well as the Métis people. Because this meeting, like most right now, is being held virtually, a singular land acknowledgement neither honors all of the peoples and nations who cared for this land before us, nor does it capture the richness of our distribution across Canada. I encourage each of you to take a moment to acknowledge the land from which you are joining today's webinar and to reflect on how we can move forward, each move forward in reconciliation and collaboration. Since our beginnings in Victoria, BC in 1963, federal retirees have advocated to protect our members' earned pensions and benefits and to improve the lives of all Canadians in retirement. Our nonpartisan advocacy work supports secure, healthy, and dignified retirements for federal retirees and all Canadians. The ability to age in place with dignity and security should not depend on your postal code, but as we've seen during the COVID-19 pandemic, that is increasingly the case. Canadians of all ages urgently need all levels of government working together on these priorities to ensure health care is available, medications are affordable, communities are accessible, and retirement incomes are secure. Thank you to everyone who's joining us this afternoon, and especially to John Delacourt, who will be speaking with us today to help us understand the outlook for federal politics in 2021 and the key moments we should be watching out for this year. John spent 12 years working on Parliament Hill for three Liberal governments. He was the Director of Communications at the Liberal Caucus Research uh, Bureau, where he worked closely with the Prime Minister's office, providing communications and issues management support on a wide range of policy initiatives. John has also worked with ministers and members of Parliament in a number of different political roles. He joined Hill and Knowlton Strategies at their Ottawa office to lead their public affairs team in 2019. John is a successful author and public commentator on national affairs, has published three novels, 
and written for Policy Magazine, The Hill Times, and The Ottawa Citizen. Thanks for joining us today, John. Uh, before we get started, though, we have a few instructions to help you make the most of our town hall. hall. Uh, Joanne Miron from Federal Retirees will walk us through these. Joanne? So again, thank you, Linda. First, I want to inform everyone that this webinar is being recorded and will be emailed to everyone who registered for this town hall later this week. While we share these screenshots, you will notice the speaker's video box as well. If the box hides some of the images we are sharing, simply minimize it by clicking the line in the top left corner or move it by dragging it with your mouse elsewhere on your screen. To enter or exit full screen viewing on your device, click the button labeled enter or exit full screen or uh, the diagonal arrow, depending on your device uh, located, that's located at top right-hand corner of the Zoom window. All attendees are in view mode only, which means you'll only be able to see the presenters. So if you would like to ask a question during the webinar, click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to open up the Q&A window. From the Q&A window, you may type your question in the box and click the send button to submit your question. Note that all questions that we will answer during the webinar will appear above the question box. We'll be answering questions at the end of our presentation, but please type them as you think of them. I would like to also point out that you can vote on questions that have been submitted by clicking the thumbs up icon. This will help our team understand what you most want to know about our panelists today. If you see a question you'd like to have answered, please click the thumbs up icon. Uh, the the chat option at the bottom of your screen is unavailable except to the for the copy and paste of the link to the French slide. So please be sure to use the Q&A feature to submit your question. Should you need to leave the webinar at any time, simply click the red leave button at the bottom right corner. Okay. Uh <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, Joanne. Uh, I guess with that, we'll get started. Um, John will lead us through an outlook for federal politics in 2021, and we'll have time to answer some of your questions at the end, as Joanne just uh, explained. Don't forget to ask those questions in the Q&A feature and vote with a thumbs up for questions that you'd like to see answered. John, over to you. Thank you very much, Linda. And uh, also, if uh, your questions um, are not answered within the course of our conversation this afternoon, um, by all means, uh, know that um, I will be available um, to provide you with answers to those questions um, at uh, over in the days ahead. Um, because uh, I think so much of this, hopefully, will be a conversation. Um, what I hope to present for you is really a kind of overview of um, what we can anticipate for the year ahead. And if I were to characterize it um, as a, a year that um, per presents, I think, unprecedented challenges, know that I am trying to, as much as possible, not repeat the phrase <laughs> over and over again, because this truly is a, a year without precedence, uh, with a year uh, and a year without a year with unprecedented considerations. Um, all of which uh, we'll see, I think, uh, fully realized with the presentation of the budget. Um, so um, what we're gonna focus on as much as possible um, in the time that we have is just an overview of minority government considerations, important dates, uh, leaders and influencers, and then legislative priorities um, that we're, we can see moving forward. Working in a, a minority government post-budget will present some, some challenges that, as mentioned, um, is unprecedented 
for not only this government, but governments moving forward, um, specifically in building back. Um, we are now, as it is, I'm sure, hard to believe for all of us, in month 14 of crisis mode. Um, and the crisis that this government has um, been attempting to manage um, on a weekly basis has really characterized um, what we have seen as the most, um, I think, effective policy um, development considerations that we are now seeing articulated in the budget. And to be more specific, um, what we'll see, I think, is an ambitious plan as part of the Building Pat Back Better rubric um, to really focus on how, um, and, and I guess the best way to put this is, the pandemic has really um, pulled a curtain back on systemic inequities, challenges that, um, that have been, I think, uh, um, have been visible, but not necessarily addressed effectively. And now I think um, governments are compelled more than ever um, to, to deal with these. Uh, most acutely, I think we've seen this play out with long-term care. But so many of these issues, um, as we see them uh, articulated in the budget, will also, of course, have to um, pass as legislation in the House. And the overarching consideration that we're all facing, of course, is the timing for the next election. And the considerations that this government is currently uh, reflecting on uh, with regard to, are they in winning conditions for a majority? Are they in, uh, are we in a, a situation where Canadians will um, uh, perhaps virtually vote with, with their feet on, it, on this issue? And, uh, and with a kind of pox on all your houses, um, reject any initiative by this government to, to, to claim a majority. But beyond the pandemic, virtually every piece of legislation we will see will be exposed for its what we call points of cleavage or its wedge issues. And, and in that sense, um, I think it's um, indicative when we see in the budget, for example, not simply with long-term care, but with clean technology initiatives, with um, the Canada Child Benefit, with ways in which this government has targeted social policy initiatives uh, to address um, the challenges of the pandemic, how, where there will be points of differentiation between the conservative vision and, versus the liberal vision currently. So with that also, um, as the conservatives and the NDP seek to define themselves with Canadians, more opposition motions that outline election positioning will uh, dominate the narrative in the House. So much of this government's openness and efforts at collaboration will continue to be defined though by the management of the vaccine rollout. And there will be a greater effort to build support on the Senate side for the legislation that does manage to move forward. Um, notable from the last mandate, uh, the first Trudeau mandate was the fact that fully one third of all legislation received significant amendments on the Senate side. And of course we have if we included the unaffiliated group, five Senate groups now. So it is a thicket of policy considerations uh, when, uh, when we look at the legislative process now uh, that has only been, I think, um, exas exacerbated um, by um, the, the individual Senate groups and their agendas. That said, support for long-term care and our most vulnerable are important components of this government's stated directive to build back better. Yet, of course, a lot of that will be defined by what we see uh, emerging uh, within that signature policy document, the budget on April 19th. A quick overview of the timeline. From the tabling of the budget to when it goes to finance committee, the next point on this timeline to watch for uh, I would say for everyone is how we see the vaccination rollout uh, impacting um, the, in a, in a really kind of ruthless way, uh, the fortunes of the political parties. I think we've seen right now that it is a highly volatile situation, but the approval numbers of this government continue to be strong. 
the approval numbers of the provincial governments may may be a volatile issue uh, in the months ahead. But this government is watching this closely and polling internally to see how its own approval numbers um, are, are, I think, um, uh, are, are creating, again, the conditions for perhaps another election campaign. Um, that said, um, if indeed we get through this legislative session, the House rises in June, uh, it is likely that the final drafts of the platforms, the election the campaign platforms of the individual parties will be finalized. Um, that June to August period could present though, our first possible campaign period. But I think it is more realistic for all of us to view this as a year where it is highly likely that we will see an election campaign. The highly volatile factor though is uh, just exactly when. Um, the government itself, though, um, has a number of overarching concerns <laughs> from which they have to address this issue of um, what, what constitutes um, winning conditions or majority status for them moving forward. Um, they've outlined several priorities from its fall economic statement that we'll see articulated in a more of, of substantive manner including a rapid housing initiative, further elaborations on the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. Um, as I mentioned, an increased effort to advance economic transition uh, away from uh, um, the, the resource sector, uh, uh, an economy dominated by um, the fortunes of our fossil fuel industries. Um, and of course, um, the fiscal stimulus measures um, uh, will also be, uh, an issue that is balanced with an effort to create 1 million jobs and to get Canadians working again. And a lot of the efforts that we'll see by way of reskilling um, training programs, you'll see a greater role for the federal government weighing heavily on the minds of the prime minister's office right now in terms of what they are hope to table and what they hope to communicate following the tabling of the budget. However, um, the opposition will inevitably look for, as mentioned, those points of cleavage, those wedge issues uh, to, to drive their own narrative forward. Um, um, as I think it's no surprise for all of us or, or no, <laughs> uh, no news to anyone that, um, that uh, being in the opposition currently is a real challenge because Canadians' um, attention is not focused on partisan politics, it really isn't. Uh, and uh, every party's internal polling will affirm that. Canadians are focused on, on how effectively this economic recovery period will be articulated and how effectively the vaccine rollout will be managed. These are first and foremost, the issues that are, um, that are dominating the narrative of every campaign election platform. That said, uh, Mr. O'Toole, does have a challenge right now in his ability to, uh, to really um, position himself um, as a viable alternative um, to, the, to the government. Part of it is uh, the perennial challenge of any opposition leader, but it, but it is, I think, only exacerbated by the fact that um, on many fronts, Canadians um, want to see government working together. That said, Conservatives will play a significant role in parliamentary committees in the new se uh, session uh, following the tabling of the budget, and there will be increased influence on their voice on pharmacare, platform-focused legislation on, uh, as, uh, on building back better. But, but ultimately, um, it is becoming abundantly clear that Mr. O'Toole will probably see the next election campaign as, as his own crucible. Uh, and as in an effort to um, build consensus within his party. I think he's, he's, as we all saw from the last policy convention, he faced a, an issue of internal divisions that drove uh, the, the, the party's position on uh, climate change. And um, I think it's indicative of some of the challenges he has in uniting a base once again on issues that uh, are proving divisive. Jagmeet Singh though, um, from his last campaign is actually in a position of advantage to gain more seats. 
um, many of the NDP's uh, issues and policy initiatives um, are, are perhaps not only in accord with this government, but this government um, I think will be challenged to, um, to advance as progressive an agenda and to work effectively with um, uh, Mr. Singh's opposition. Um, uh, he is in a great position, I think, also to uh, be uh, to provide that that corrective to some of the um, uh, uh, the more um, I guess I would say <laughs> characteristically liberal um, centrist ish, um, uh, policy initiatives. Um, in other words, this is a time as we emerge from crisis where government's role in Canadians' lives um, uh, has to be foregrounded more than ever, especially. Uh, with regard to long-term care, with regard to uh, uh, the support for frontline workers, with support for, um, uh, for, for education, all of the fronts that are usually more um, provincially focused. And that is where, given Mr. Singh's background at Queen's Park, he's actually once again in a position of possible advantage. How he can translate that into seats in the House is, is a, will of course be his, his his, his challenge uh, in the upcoming campaign. Um, Mr. Blanchet is in a position where uh, really, once again, he is also, um, I think, looking uh, to uh, the fortunes of the of, of, uh, Coalition Avenir Quebec to, um, to align himself effectively and strategically um, and to choose his moment when um, he no longer supports the government based on the approval and where he sees an opportunity uh, to advance his own numbers and his political capital in Ottawa. Um, we can, I think, uh, expect from Mr. Blanchet um, uh, an increasingly, um, I don't want to use the word strident, but I will use the word forceful um, voice in his commitment uh, to um, uh, the provinces um, ownership of all health care issues, seniors care issues, and of course, um, uh, their, to, to manage their own economic destiny. Um, an outlier and, and the party I think to watch for a most interesting developments is with the Green Party where we may see uh, some real um, opportunities for advancement and increased presence uh, in the House of Commons. Uh, Enemy Paul, the new leader, is running in Toronto Centre. And the most interesting thing about her campaign currently is her, is her ability to bring over support from the NDP in that, uh, in that riding, which um, shows, uh, has always shown great potential for growth for the NDP. Her ability to pull some of that progressive vote is unprecedented for <laughs> a Green Party leader. Elizabeth May was far more aligned with more centrist policies of, uh, especially with this liberal government. And Anami Paul, once again, is playing a more activist and perhaps a more um, counterbalancing role um, uh, in, uh, as a federal voice. However, uh, and uh, regardless of how we, uh, I think, view the months ahead as dominated by a campaign narrative. COVID-19 crisis management will remain the highest priority. Um, what we will see emerging with the budget is the return of a fiscal anchor. And what that really means is simply this, um, a projection based uh, probably on a five year scenario uh, for when uh, we will return to a debt to GDP ratio that is um, reflective of the world prior to COVID. However, considerations will, uh, uh, that, that will dominate um, coming out of the tabling of the budget will also include wage subsidy and financing that will focus for the first time on individual sectors in a substantive way. Specifically, the charitable sector will be of interest for us, um, but also I think, um, I think um, as we've seen play out over the last, I'd say six to eight months of, of the, the pandemic, um, an increase, increasing momentum around um, support for the airline sector, uh, support for um, 
the transport sector specifically too in, in, in its role for um, uh, the advancement or the expeditious advancement of our supply chains. Um, so much of the challenges with regard to PPE as we try to sort of nationalize our own production of personal protective equipment, nationalize our own production of vaccines, so much of that, uh, of, the, of the current conversation around how effectively governments are delivering for Canadians is based on um, how effectively supply chains are also uh, moving forward. Pharmacare though, will focus on the first stage of a rare disease strategy. Um, and that's the express commitment of this government through its mandate letters. Um, and the patented medicines review uh, pricing uh, that we, uh, the guidelines themselves will move forward. What that means for us, of course, is that there will be an effort to provide affordable um, pharmacare for Canadians. Uh, one where um, um, pricing, especially for some of the, the most cost intensive um, production of, of, of new uh, pharmaceutical products, that inevitably I think we'll, um, we'll see a, a, a compelling narrative from this government that is delivering for Canadians on that front. Uh, lastly though, all of this will be focused around uh, this, as we've seen in the US on this building back better narrative. Uh, I think of note here is the um, multiple trillion dollar uh, bill that went through the um, Congress in the US that is you know, notionally about infrastructure, but covers social infrastructure. So much, the, there has been, I think an, an elastic definition of what infrastructure really means. And you'll see that reflected in this budget too. In other words, it will cover community building, first and foremost, ways in which our communities will be supported by the government in new and effective and hopefully innovative ways. All of that said, the government is still very much in crisis mode and the final draft of the budget will note this, but be forward looking to a recovery uh, economy. Some recommendations though for us include um, a whole of government approach. Um, we really do need to, I think, find our champions, not only around the cabinet table, but put a regional lens on where um, we've seen the impact of this pandemic been most acutely felt, especially for seniors across this country and how we can um, energize, animate and motivate uh, those local voices as they, as they are decision makers uh, in parliament um, to really build that, that necessary um, framework for a true vision for seniors uh, uh, coming out of uh, the, the, the tabling of the budget and what we see as the government's priorities and plannings moving forward. An intergovernmental focus on seniors issues, long-term care especially, should be seen as an opportunity um, to uh, for, for a more overarching vision uh, for uh, as, as the larger demographic of Canadians shifts. Um, all of this, um, I think we are well positioned to be a key voice in this conversation, this key public policy conversation moving forward. So with that, um, I wanted to uh, provide everyone with enough time for your questions. And to speak to what I hope um, is perhaps um, some of your more urgent concerns. But as mentioned, before we go into this, uh, this section of uh, presentation, um, know that I'm happy to follow up with the questions we do not address uh, in our conversation today. Um, okay, um, I have a question here. We have a question from Sandra, John. Uh, COVID has disproportionately impacted women, especially in terms of those working in essential sectors or jobs. Um, and in terms of the huge value of unpaid or informal caregiving, what will build back really mean for women in Canada from the yeah. perspective of the government and opposition parties? Yeah, um, and, and I would base this only on my conversation with the Deputy Prime Minister's office. Um, there is a clear sense, and I think you saw this with the um, advisory group uh, struck on um, uh, to address 
what uh, many are calling the Xi session. Um, there, is an, there is going to be an effort. I mean, the, the government has, through its effort at, um, at, at gender balance within its uh, cabinet and its caucus, they've also perhaps, uh, uh, and, and I think there's a lot of work still to be done um, by this government to put a, a gender uh, parity uh, lens on their own individual policy initiatives. But where this has been reflected um, over the last five years is all current infrastructure projects have to pass that, uh, that, that gender parity um, uh, um, analysis. And um, that will have even more significant implications um, given the fact that this government, much like the US, will put such a huge um, uh, prior or identify it as such a huge priority uh, for this, they're building back uh, better agenda. In that sense, social infrastructure, um, basic uh, bricks and mortar infrastructure, but infrastructure about community building will also include a more gender balanced perspective going forward. Uh, and, and that advisory uh, group will hopefully be a part of that, uh, of that conversation. That said, I think this is an area where the opposition, as mentioned, I think can, can see a real opening by way of the work that is still left to do. Notably too, on this front, more than ever, uh, when we look at um, how gender issues um, level up uh, at the board level, um, I think you will see, um, once again, a more rigorous conversation and more public conversation on systemic uh, inequities uh, within that larger boardroom conversation as well. So uh, those are just, uh, you know, what we can predict by way of uh, what, what will emerge from the, uh, the budget and, the, and this government's priorities. Okay, thank you, John. Um, our next question uh, seems to be getting a lot of uh, thumbs up. Um, and it is, uh, what is the prospect of starting to move toward universal or universal, oh, sorry, universal basic income in this budget? Uh, or perhaps in party platforms, given the in inequities in inequalities that have been laid bare during the pandemic. Yeah, um, you know, notably, um, the one um, member of Trudeau's cabinet who's done significant amount of work on this is um, Jean-Yves Duclos. Um, and uh, Duclos, notably, is a strong voice uh, in support of UBI. Um, other champions within caucus include Adam Vaughn, uh, who has been tasked with the, uh, a great deal of the, uh, the national housing strategy. Know that um, you can expect this conversation to gain momentum. I would anticipate that it will be a strong policy resolution coming out of uh, the Liberal Convention this weekend. Um, but, but more specifically, I think we'll see this uh, gain momentum given the precedents, uh, the, the, you know, the, the proof points uh, for uh, UBI. Ultimately though, um, as it moves forward, um, I think this government uh, and uh, in a, a perhaps a more strategic <laughs> calculus on the advancement of UBI, this government will also view this as a majority government kind of uh, initiative in the sense that, um, you know, they would hope to move forward with, with um, this with the support of a uh, significant number of Canadians. That said, I, I don't think it's off necessarily off the table. Um, but once again, I think uh, we'll see a really strong voice for this also um, coming out of the NDP uh, convention. And that is a real, uh, I think, uh, strong, uh, 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 from a tactical perspective, a strong component of uh, an effective opposition strategy too. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question uh, speaks to federalism and a burning issue we're all aware of. Mm -hmm. How do you see federal, provincial, and territorial governments working together for the greater good, in particular on long-term care? Yeah, um, you know, one of the challenges as, as uh, uh, that this government uh, still uh, is, is, is trying to manage is that, that intergovernmental, um, the intergovernmental relations writ large. Um, uh, a couple of uh, decisions over the last uh, few months are reflective of this. Uh, putting Jim Carr in uh, the role of uh, the Minister for the Prairie Provinces, uh, 
providing Dominic Labonk with additional resources, but ultimately um, uh, providing the deputy prime minister with significantly additional resources for uh, intergovernmental, intergovernmental relations. Um, all of these point to the fact that this government uh, views um, uh, that this as a high priority. Notably enough to, I would say this, um, the acting clerk of the Privy Council, um, Janice Charette, her her specialty is in intergovernmental relations. Uh, I worked with uh, Ms. Charette uh, when she was a deputy minister um, prior to her um, uh, position in the UK. And I would tell you that um, this government uh, uh, views um, her perspective very highly uh, and will look to it um, because this, as the vaccine rollout, I think has only made clear to all of us, this is a burning issue for this government, how it will work effectively with the provinces. But there is a notable challenge with the politicization of, of uh, the vaccine rollout that we're seeing play out right now. And unfortunately, this is where I would have to be a little bit pessimistic. I can only see relations coarsening as the challenges increase. Um, with uh, Ontario as an example here, with um, what looks to be by the end of this week, close to a million vaccines in the freezers, not in the arms of the 14.57 million um, Ontarians, that will inevitably coarsen relations between the federal government and, and the provinces. So, um, so I view this as a highly volatile situation, but it's a frontline conversation uh, with these key cabinet players that I've mentioned. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question now from Richard. Uh, which just disappeared on me. <laughs> Hang on, sorry. <laughs> um, how likely is it that we'll see a tax on the capital gains from the sale of primary residences given, sorry, given uh, where Canada's housing market and budget prospects are? Yes, um, this, has been a, this has been a conversation for the last uh, few years actually in government. Uh, um, uh, this government, um, and this, I would cite this as far back as when I worked uh, with them as well. This government doesn't leak, unfortunately, <laughs> any budget, unless it wants to leak um, what, what will be budget commitments. But I will say this, um, if this is any uh, note about the dynamics within parliament, um, I would say this, um, the exit of Bill Morneau uh, represented the exit of a more fiscally conservative influence on the direction things were going. Um, uh, Morneau was always um, a, a strong voice of opposition uh, uh, to move forward with this capital gains tax. Um, that opposition is somewhat minimized now. <laughs> Still exists though strongly um, within um, the department side of finance. But what I would say is um, the conversation has definitely changed. Whether it will change um, in the direction of this tax, um, uh, I would suggest once again that that may be a more more of a majority government commitment than it would be a minority government commitment. Um, that's it. Um, it. It's it, it it's still it's still very very possible because I know it's a, it's an active conversation for the last five months uh, over finance. Okay. Um... On the prospect and timing of an election, uh, mm -hmm. Canadians, including some of the people on this webinar, don't want to go to an election right now. Uh, we saw the wheels fall off uh, in Newfoundland's provincial election recently when the COVID outbreak necessitated cancelling in-person voting and moving to mail-in ballots, and the results took weeks to finalize. But yes. so far, every provincial government that's headed to a pandemic election has been handed back a mandate um, with incumbent premiers taking the vote. So which parties are motivated to go to the polls soon and which will want to wait? Um, the stated commitment of the opposition at this point is um, an election uh, post crisis, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, in other words, um, there's no uh, at least expressed appetite to go into a campaign, certainly no expressed appetite to go into a campaign anytime soon from the government as well. That said, um, uh, I would, I think, watch very closely the conversations that uh, that are happening on the ground uh, this weekend uh, with the NDP and the Liberals uh, by way of uh, the 
commitments uh, by, by way of policy resolutions, but also notably enough, um, if one were to take a look at the, um, the program agenda for the Liberal Convention, a lot of time spent there on campaign planning. Um, you could say it's contingency planning, but uh, the challenge any government has um, is, and this government specifically is, with the fact that it lost a majority government, the more restive voices in caucus that speak to the fact that this is the time when a majority could be won again, they are really difficult to tamp down within um, caucus. Uh, especially in caucus dynamics. If anybody has ever been at a caucus meeting, um, uh, uh, the loud forceful argument for a majority government often um, <laughs> gets a lot of attention. Um, so I would say um, that um, this, uh, I think there is every indication that um, governments have been rewarded with majorities. Um, coming through this pandemic. And there's every indication that uh, that would be a president, a precedent that this government would look to too. It was notably though, it was looking closely at the Newfoundland result. And it certainly gave everyone pause to reflect, but, but uh, Premier Fury came back uh, with a strong, uh, regardless of uh, uh, the drop in his own approval ratings, he did manage this um, and that, once again, will be a strong, uh, strong argument within caucus. Um, so that's a long answer to suggest <laughs> that caucus dynamics will rule and overrule any note of caution that a government, um, uh, I think, would, would hope to advance right now. So okay. in other words, it, I would not be surprised with a June election. All right, uh, so we have our last question now. Um, what are your top three predictions for the budget April 19th and the politics and jockeying that will follow the budget? Top three predictions, yeah. Well, um, I would say an increased role for the federal government with long-term care, absolutely. Uh, an increased role uh, of the government for reskilling, um, job training, um, for a greater um, role in what is normally a more provincial um, uh, responsibility. And that is um, not only getting Canadians back to work, but getting ca Canadians uh, in new work and new jobs. Um, but I think we'll also see an expanded commitment on affordable housing. Um, and all of that will also be wrapped around um, the signature piece that you will see in this budget. And that is an ambitious um, infrastructure uh, plan. Um, uh, Michael Sabia's role as the deputy minister um, in Finance Canada um, is reflective of uh, a an, an strong, um, strong point of influence on, on that decision. Um, I think we'll see that move forward. Um, much like we've seen it, I, I would say, look to what the US hopes to accomplish with its infrastructure bill. And I think we'll see uh, it, it replicated in, the, in this government's efforts with this budget. Okay, well, thank you, John. All of our uh, thanks for sharing uh, your outlook with us. Thank um, you, I appreciate it. Where am I going? So, um, sorry guys, I'm, I'm losing my place here. <laughs> <laughs> um, no uh, with the minority government, the ongoing pandemic response, party conventions and April budget and issues that have united and divided Canadians and party leaders, it all has federal politics taking on a new intensity and leading toward an election that seems increasingly inevitable in 2021. I hope this outlook has helped put context around the key moments to come for federal politics this year. And as for whether or not we'll head to the polls before we each get our vaccine, we'll have to wait and see. It's clear we will need a stronger team than ever before to have an impact in 2021 and during the federal election. If you'd like to be part of the federal retirees advocacy movement, please join REACH 338, our nationwide network of advocates mm -hmm. working together to advance our mission to improve the quality and security of retirement for our members and all Canadians. REACH 338, 
uh, is a great way to influence the priorities of our next government. You can find a link to join on our website at www.federalretirees.ca. Thanks again to John Delacorte with Helen Knowlton Strategies and to all of you for taking the time to join us. I'll end with the words of one of our leading public health officials uh, during the, uh, the pandemic, Dr. Bonnie Henry, and encourage all of you to continue to be kind, be calm, take care of each other and stay safe. And for our Eastern Canadians, per Janice Fitzgerald, hold fast. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you everyone too.